Hi, everybody. My name is Yvonne. I'm from Alliance Fire Science. So before we begin the presentation, I would like to briefly introduce Alliance Fire Science. So Alliance Fire Science, we are established in 2016. We are a private company providing life science products and services catering to various needs of biomedical and healthcare research here in Singapore and also in Asia Pacific. So our interests are mainly towards the translational research, such as those in oncology and gene cell therapy. So we have a wide portfolio of services and products, and here are some that I would like to um, briefly share with you. So this includes the basic cell culture, media, animal serum, and also imaging dyes for cellular cleaning, western blotting, flow cytometry reagents, and also a whole range of growth factors. So in terms of oncology and drug development and delivery, we do have this hydrogel coated labware, which is a specialized labware for you to culture your cells on different subject stiffness to mimic the tissue environment. So we also do have specialized labware for 3D culture for spirit formation, and also a microfluidic chip like labware for you to isolate single cell and culture. So in terms of drug delivery, we do have nanoparticles, MNT derived exosomes and human serum albumin. For those looking into um, drug metabolism, you may want to look at our human liver cells, primary human liver cells. For those more towards like looking into the oncology research where we also do provide tumor biopsies, PDX cell lines, and also the animal models, which Dr. Han will be talking more about it later on. So we also do provide preclinical oncology services. So for those who are interested in like, you know, preclinical efficacy studies, we also provide these services as well. So in terms of cell and gene therapy, we do have specialized media for NK cells and T cells, and also human carrier lysics, GMP growth factors as well. So we also have this specialized um, ECM, which is a um, alternative to major gel called recombinant laminin, where, we're, where one can actually use this for the culture of IPSC and ESC cells. So if you're looking into a uh, different alternative to major gel, you may want to explore laminin here. We also provide different types of immune cells. So if you're looking into like you know, PBMC, cord blood, C34, T or NK cells, we have that as well. And also mesochemical stem cells from different sources. So we are also moving towards like you know, bioprocessing, where now we have cell factories, microcarriers, plant-based growth factors. We also provide other services, which include custom DNA and peptide synthesis. And also this will be something interesting, which is called the electronic lab notebooks, which is, you know, basically it's a shift from the paper notebook to electronic, where you can actually save your data, have a proper project management, data management in this um, cloud software. So all in all, we are a one-stop platform. We are able to provide you with a whole suite of solutions to help you to complete your research workflow. So if you have any questions, please feel free to write to us and also visit our website, which you can see the whole range of products and services that Atlantis Bioscience can provide. Also do visit our social media platforms because we um, are quite frequent in this platform. So we have been updating news and you know updates in these platforms as well. So, okay now, so without um, further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. So we are very honored to be able to invite Gen Pharmatech Dr. Han Bing Zhou, uh, research R&D scientist from Gen Pharmatech, to give a uh, talk about the topic genetically modified mouse models and applications. Dr. Han has more than eight years of experience in animal genome manipulation. He received both his bachelor and doctorate degree from Beijing University. During his graduate study, Dr. Han was looking in the development of conditional gene manipulation technology in animals. So his current work is focusing on construction and evaluation of metabolic disease-related animal models and optimization of genome editing technologies in mice. So now let me hand over to Dr. Han. Okay, give me a moment to stop sharing. And... Can you see my screen? Oh, sure. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you Yvonne, for your introduction. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Han Bing Zhou. I'm from Gen Pharmatech. I'm currently an R&D scientist here who is responsible for the genome editing model animal generation here. So today's topic is about genetically modified mouse model and their applications. So 
I don't want to talk too much about to, to emphasize the importance of lab animals, since I need to quote the Nobel Prize Committee that lab animals have made important contributions to nearly every Nobel Prize in medicine. So we use models, you know, to reflect ourselves to do research that we cannot pre perform on humans. So in all the models we apply, we need one mammal model with some, you know, advantages with like close genetic relationship and an advanced application of genetic tools and small size, short less span and low cost, high reproduction capacity. So during the development of these tools, mice was chosen as one of the most popular model animals all over the world. And I think everyone knows here. So the Dr. Tailman in America, she said that the mouse sequence will be the Rosetta Stone that will help us inter inter interpret the human genome. I think that not only based on sequencing, but also the organs, the behavior, and everything from mouse can, you know, in as the, the Rotata stone that help us understand ourselves about our health and to advance our medicine research. So based on the gen genome modification mice, we need to know the history, how we obtain mutants, animal models, including mice. So first, we don't have the genome sequence in the past like 50 years ago of most of the organisms and rather, and instead we use the spontaneous mutations generating during our breeding of the animals. And also we apply different ways like in physical way using radiation, chemical way using ENU or EMS, or using biological ways like in gene trap or retroviruses to induce random mutations in the genome. And then we brought these strings together to guide the mute, to have the mutants that with the phenotypes we want to study. And then we do like positional cloning, mapping of these mutations, and then Found, clone the mutated gene and the study's function. So this process from the phenotype to genotype is called forward genetics by the pioneers. And but recently in the late years, since the 1980s in the last century, the targeted modification of genome become possible with some genes cloned and sequenced. And then it is first based on the mice embryonic stem cell based targeted mutagenesis strategy and soon and replaced soon by developing of the development of the endogenous endonucleases medic mutations like Zephyr and Talon and CRISPR case. So because this process is started from the mutation or alteration of the endogenous genome to get the correlated phenotype. And so this is the reverse of the first developed forward genetics. So it's named as reverse genetic approaches. But even it is you know, kind of reverse. This is the you no know, one of the most popular tools we use today for study of gene functions and model generation. So here's a brief history of the development of reverse genetic tools. So from Watson Crick, they and their colleagues, they developed, they discovered the DNA double helix structure in 1953, and then after some times with four genetics, many important genes were cloned and identified and sequenced by Sanger sequencing. And then finally, due to 1982, the ESA-based homologous recombination gene targeting is developed as the first generation of re reverse genetic tool. And then years pass, the development and application of the zinc finger nucleus, which is based on the DNA specific binding capacity of the zinc finger proteins from the transcription factors and the fusion with the nucleus domain of the FOC1 DNA nucleus has become the first engineered endonucleus and started the second generation of DNA targeting. But ZFN is limited to its affinity with the DNA and also its low specificity and the requirement of screening. So then in 2010 and then 2012, the development and application of talents and especially the well-developed CRISPR-Cas system, which is applied all over the world and very famous, which got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020, has become one of the popular, most popular tools we use now, and also the major methods we apply in gene pharmatech. So first, in the first part of the background, I want to briefly share you with the most known modification strategies. So the modification strategies we can do and starts from the most basic one, like the knockout or the loss of function of the endogenous gene with knockouts to disrupt it and also a little advanced using a conditional knockout like to generate this loss of function in a tissue or time specific inducible manner. And then after the brief knockout, we can introduce novel sequences like 
coding sequence of endogenous or exogenous sequences, and also regulatory sequence to regulate endogenous genes, and also point mutations like genes coding reporters, recombinants, and other regulation systems, and also protein tags, especially for those we don't have appropriate antibodies to tag and label them. And also we can combine knockout and the multiple knockings together to generate complex modifications. Like we can target multiple genes to get multiple to achieve to meet multiple purposes simultaneously. And also we can do gene humanization by replacing the endogenous mice gene with a homologous human gene or genes from other species of interest. Last but not least, the traditional but still powerful transgenic technology is also applied in our facility. But also because we have safe harbors in mice, I will introduce you later, we can do the transgene-like approach by the knocking strategy in a controlled in manner of insertion with a certain insertion set and uh, without any interruption to the endogenous genome and gene function. So here I listed all the commonly used engineered strains with different genetic backgrounds here in gene pharmatech. And also we can provide services of editing on SD rights. So first, here's a, yes, here's a schematic graph of the conventional knockout like whole body loss of function generation in mice. So basically I showed three of the most common technologies we can achieve to, we, we can do to achieve a gene's loss of function. We can either you know, remove the vital essential coding axons using two target sets in the non-coding sequences, like in tronic sequence, like this first one, I'm sorry, let me give you a pointer. And, or I can use the two target sets, one upstream of the five prime untranslated sequence, the other downstream of the three prime untranslated sequence to make a complete knockout of the gene. And the second one I want to talk is that you can also design this target set on a code axon. It, it is important, especially for those genes with only one axon which exists because our endog the endogenous DNA repair system will result in a random insertion or deletion after the cleavage of the CRISPR-Cas9 here. And if this in so-called insertional deletion or indel mutation is not divided, cannot be divided by three, it will generate a frame shift code mutation and then commonly will generate a premature stop code on this gene to truncate its expression and, uh, and disable its MRA, causing the knockout loss of function of the gene. So traditional or conventional knockout is powerful and uh, it is applied in many research, but it still has its limitations. Like when the, in the simplest manner, if the knockout leads to an embryonic prenatal or neonatal death in the animals, and also in other complex conditions or situations, like if there's abnormality or disruption in multiple tissues or organs, we cannot tell one from each other which is the major effect and whether the other is the secondary effect or what else. So, and also if there's positive secondary effect caused by a crosstalk between the cells and tissues, it is the similar thing I talked before. And if there's any genetic compensation, and also last but not least, if there's difference between developmental stages and between childhood and adulthood, if we do conventional knockout, we can tell from we cannot tell from the development stage, from the neonatal stage to the adult stage because the genes are riding loss of function. So in this way, we need a inducible, controllable man, a manner in control to you know generate mutations in different stages. So scientists basically take advantage of the create lock p system to generate conditional knockout, like in certain conditions, like in different tissues, organs, or cell types, or in a time-inducible, time-specific manner I will introduce later. So from a molecular or genetic view, we just insert the two locks p containing donors by homologous recombination combined with the CRISPR-Cas9 cleavage on the genome, and simultaneously insert two locks p sites flunking one or multiple vital coding axons of the target gene, and then took, take a, taking advantage of the Cray-Lox P system from the virus, the Cray recombinants will mediate the recombination of two Lox P's. And if these two are designed to be placed in the same direction, the sequence between the two Lox P's will be eliminated from the genome and then causing a Cray dependent sequence deletion and thus Cray dependent gene loss of function. 
in this case. Uh, so create dependent means it's the most common way we generate conditional knockouts. So here's a schematic of the how it works. So basically we generate different lines, some with pro tissue specific promoter driving query combinatorial expression whose construction I will mention later. And the other with the flux genes like conditional alleles, homozygous. When we cross this together, this mouse bearing a homozygous flux allele with a tissue specific query expression. And if this cell simultaneously express pre and with the homozygous flux alleles, query recombinants will mediate the recombination of the log speed sequence and then inactivating this gene of interest by deleting this vital coding sequences. And that leads to a tissue specific gene mutation dependent on the promoter X, which means that in which cells or tissues this query recombinants is expressed. So in a most advanced way, when scientists try to, you know, introduced the time-inducible knockout. They took advantage of the characteristics of the estrogen receptor in mammals, which means that we know that estrogen receptor based on the cell in the cytoplasm of our cells because the estrogen can pass through the cell membrane easily. So in this case, they mutate this estrogen receptor in this ERT2 form with several point mutations and make it more, you know, uh, make it more affinite to the its agonist uh, amoxifen and its map metabolites and less combined to the endogenous estrogen to keep the specificity. And then in this case, we cross this flux allele with this tissue specific cre ER string together. So in normal conditions without the application of its Agonist, the ERT2 domain will keep the CRE into the cytoplasm by its interaction with heat shock protein 19 in the cytoplasm and uh, keep it away from the nucleus, that's away from the genome to inactivate the CRE recombination activi activity. And also in other cells which do not express CRE recombinants, it won't happen, at, it won't happen too because there's no pro CRE ER protein. However, if we apply this agonist tamoxifen into our mice, the tamoxifen binding of ERT2 will release this protein from heat shock protein 90 and guide this construct, this protein into the cell nucleus and then mediate flux period recombination in the genome, resulting in deletion of the flux sequence in CRE expressing cells, but not in the CRE silent cells not in the create absent cells. So it generates a drug inducible time specific conditional knockout. So we already introduced about the generation of the flux alleles and how the principle we can get conditional knockouts. However, how can we get the create strains? We can actually, we can do this in different manners. Let's take this, you know, targeted knocking in, in possibly every gene we can achieve this as an example. We can see that we can design crispr case systems theoretically in every point of the coding gene, but the most commonly it is placed, you know, near the start coden ATG or near the stop coden, like the end of the coding sequence or the most upstream part of the three prime UTR. And in this case, we can use donors with homology arms to introduce the exogenous genes, operating frames, or coding sequence into the endogenous gene. So this gene could be create recombinants or create ER or any reporters if you want. So what matters also in this case is the elements we use together with this coding sequence. Like in this case, if I put a transcription termination sequence like polyadenation signals downstream of the operating frame, after knocking, we can see that this operating frame or this coding sequence will be controlled and derived by the endogenous genes, promoter and regulatory sequences, resulting in its expression fully copying the expression of this targeted endogenous gene. However, the introduction of the transcription termination signal here will prevent the downstream gene from expressing, thus disrupt the endogenous gene function if we want. In the other case, let's look at this side. If I introduce this exogenous gene with a linker sequence upstream of it, it can be, you know, 
linkers like EAK linkers or GS linkers with different purposes. And also it can be a two-way peptide coding sequence, which will result in separation of the protein products upstream and downstream of this linker. And also it can be a error sequence, which initiates translation independently from the endogenous trans translation initiation site to make an uh, independent expression of the downstream protein, but with a relatively lower level, but copying the endogenous genes expression pattern like time of tissue specificity. But in this case, if we use linkers, two-way sequence, or using error sequence, it will maintain the endogenous genes expression. This is only schematic, and also we can put this linker sequence here to you know, replace the polyadenation signal, it will result in a similar result. So here's another way we can overexpress genes or introduce like query companies together with the flux strings by using tr the traditional transgene technology. Oh, so here's a question. Uh, after I introduce in this slide, I will give a brief answer of this question. Okay, so we can, Traditionally, we generate transgenes by using you know, linearized plasmids and inject them into embryos. And this linearized DNA may randomly be inserted into the genome, even if it is a long sequence lacking a bacterial artificial chromosome. So with you know, numerous regulatory sequences and the recapitulating the re expression pattern in the strain of a region of this back. So after modification, we can you know, express exogenous genes like ORFs and also reporters or other protein function such as query combinants or, you know, the Titan system and other, you know, suicide genes like DTA. And also in mice, because the researchers before they developed some, you know, safe harbors like the RUSA26 genes, you know, regularity sequence or the H11 site in the inhabitants chromosome of mice, and we can use crispr case based homologous recombination system to insert this transgene construct into this safe harbor. So it avoids the disadvantage of the transgene that the insertion is random. We cannot easily you know, identify the site which, where, the, where this construct is inserted. And also we can avoid multiple copies insertion of this construct by identification of this certain site. And in this case, we can generate stable line in, you know, limited generations. However, for transgenic lines, we may need additional efforts and the additional, you know, crosses and mating to generate a stable inherited lines for further application. So they ask how to validate the efficiency of created conditional knockout. There's certain methods, I think I will, you know, introduce this later. A little bit later because I have you know slate slides related to it. And last but not least, other than I express exogenous genes, I can we can also introduce point mutations, especially those ones homologous with human disease human disease derived mutations like shown here. Like over 60% of the human genetic variants associated with disease are single point mutations. And considering the high homology between human and mice gene, most of these variations in the axons, we can find the homology sequence in the mice and then introducing the corresponding point mutations into the mice genome by crispr cas system and donor. And then this model will be a suitable for evaluation of this uh, disease mechanism, as well as the screening and the efficacy test of the drugs targeting, specifically targeting these mutations. So here's some of the technology data with in gene pharmatech, like in different types of projects like in conventional knockout, in conditional knockout, and in knockings, we can see that the goal germline rate in germ time means that the positive founder mice, you know, comparing to the number of embryos we injected. So if you are familiar with this field, we can see that this number is you know, equally or even better compared with those well-published te technical papers about mouse embryo genome modifications. So, and from years of development, now we have the capacity to generate over 6,000 genome engineered mouse strains every year. So we have already become one of the largest genome editing mouse library and one of the largest, largest one of the largest R&D capacities in this field all over the world. So we can provide you the your customized 
MOS model from your innovation. And after you verify this strategy, we can deliver you the tool you want for your purposes. So in the second part, I will introduce about the KOAP, which is the knockout project. So based on our ability, we started this ambitious project called knockout project you know, near three and a half years before. So from this name, we can tell that our goal is to generate knockout and conditional knockouts for the near 23,000 of protein coding genes and some of the important non-codings by the next year. So already we have already constructed over 20,000 of stable genome engineered lines and more lines are in progress. Like if we get the founders and we are you know, currently waiting for its genome, you know, germline transmission assay analysis. And during this part process, we have already become the largest genome editing mass, mass model resource all over the world. And to, and need to mention that all of these strings are with independent property right of gene pharmatech. So from the resource, you know, statistics from the findmass.org, which is the worldwide mass resource update MSR. So we can see that we have the most strains registered all over the world. So for your convenience, we had develop, developed the search engines in different fields with different manners, like by gene or string name using the basic search engine. And also we have classified these genes by gene families, by the subcellular localization of the genes protein product, like if it is in the mitochondria or in the nucleus, or it is a membrane protein, which is, you know, cross membrane protein or just membrane surface protein. And also we have classified them by their tissue or organ specific expression. So in combination with the CKO strings or flock strings we generated, we have developed, you know, 243 pre strains here, you know, targeting multiple systems or, you know, whole month of the body. And we are, have validated some of them and we are continuing the validation of these strains. So here's a list of the immune system related to CRIS and part, part of them. And also in some of them like the LZ2 CRI and the CD19 CRIS, we have you know, well published papers use, applying our strains to get good results. So now this comes to the answer of the questions in the chat box, which means how to validate the efficiency of cremated knockout. So this is the validation step one is to validate its expression pattern and its final consequence of the strain. So basically we cross this CRI strain to be tested with a reporter strain, which ubiquitously, ubiquitously express GFP first, but this GFP expression cassette is floxed by two locks piece. And then after we made them together, the CRI positive cells will result in the locks P recombination and the expression of the downstream TD tomato rather than the GFP, you know, resulting in a fluorescent switch from green to red in this case, in a tissue specific manner. So in this case, the final consequence of the red fluorescence expression will indicate the CRE activity in the exam time point. So also we can, besides from the fluorescence indicators, we can also use Lexi indicators and uh, litter screening to, uh, and lint, sorry, litter staining to achieve this purpose. And also we can do, you know, Western blouse and MRI analysis in different, in specific tissues and organs to make sure the gene, of, the flux gene of interest is knocked out to evaluate the crease recombination efficiency. And also we can do genome quantification of the flux allele, which means that in the tissues or cells of interest, if the flux sequence is not, is, re, is removed by pre recombinants, the copy number of it in the genome will be, you know, significantly down-regulated to even no every copy of it, no copy of it, not any copy of it, it may, means that the query recombinants is of 100% efficiency. So we do the validation in different stages like DNA, RNA, protein, and also from the indicators. So here's one of the data that will support me from my descriptions earlier. It is the P 
PDX1 knocking create string using the C terminal knocking strategy. PDX1 is famous for its function during endoderm related organ development, especially the pancreas. So we can see that from the reporter we use here, which express the green fluorescence first and the red fluorescence after loss period combination as a reporter. We can see that in the query positive strings, the PDX1 query positive strings, nearly most of the cells express the red fluorescence instead of the green ones in the pancreas. And also some cells also saw red fluorescence in the stomach or in the duodenum, which is also you know, reasonable because the early expression of PDX ones in the progenitors of the endoderm and the, the further depetriation of these cells will you know, migrate into the stomach or the duodenum. So here's the strict quality control standards for gene Gene pharmatex mice, like the Cray strains, the Flux strains, and others. We do PCR genotyping and embryo consequence, and also sequence through the entire inserted fragment of the knockings and the Flux, if it's possible, if possible, and we do QPCR copy number variation and a single copy verification of these strains to make sure the knockings won't happen in a random way, like a transgene to interrupt with the function and expression. And also at the targeted analysis of the targeted knocking, we do the tandem repeat analysis to avoid tandem knockings repeat in the site we want. So here's some of the high impact publications using our strings from KOAP. There's over you know, 100 publications from now on, we can see you know, well-known journals like Nature and Cells using our mice, and we very appreciate that the, our customers and the scientists, they you know, give us the opportunity to demonstrate that our mice is suitable for their advanced research. So for the detailed application, you know, I want to introduce you about different parts of how we can apply genome engineered mouse models for you know, drug efficacy tests or disease analysis. So first, I want to introduce about the leptin and leptin signaling pathway. So these doctors, Dr. Coleman and Dr. Fredman, well, the, Dr. Coleman first identified these two mice strains, like OB and DB strains, and then Dr. Fredman have completed the mapping of these mutated mut mutants to be one of the leptin coding gene, one of the leptin receptor coding gene, and then their groups and the other scientists have re revealed all the leptin signaling pathway. So it is very important for some people who need to control their body weight like myself. So thank them for their contributions. And based on this, we generate leptin or leptin receptor mutations in our facility with similar, you know, phenotypes with the original video B6OB and BKSDB strains. We can see that increased uh, body weight here and also uh, diabetes phenotype with increased FGTT and uh, no fasting blood, blood glucose here. And also the cholesterol level in OB mice is in the lab, in the lab KO mice is you know, significantly upregulated and the liver function is partially damaged in this model. And also similar result has been identified in BKSDB. And uh, what's more, the insulin level is detected in early DB models is revealed to be much higher and the diabetic phenotype is more severe in DB compared to OB. And also even nearly all kinds of you know, blood, blood lipid is increased in DB models with its obesity. And also what we, I didn't show here is that DBMS also have you know, severe rhino malformation and uh, inflammation. So here's another model, which is a genome engineer based uh, obesity model we have. It is the knockout of the LS1, MS1 gene, whose homologous gene is responsible for the Alstrom syndrome in human. We can also see the obesity phenotype and also diabetic phenotype in this mutant mice is the metabolic phenotype part of this mutant mice. So as a summary, we know that we can use, you know, inducible models like, like DIO mice using, you know, high fat diet to feed the mice and get a final result. And also we can use diet feed mice and with the STZ induction and the, you know, 
disruption of pancreas beta of acid of allied beta cells to lower the insulin levels and generate this type type two diabetes model faster compared to the IO models. However, genome engineer models have the you know, advantage in the gen in the high generation time because we keep these strains commonly here in our facility. And also the stability between each individuals is much better in the genome edit edited mouse models. And also we have severe obesity compared, combined with different extent of side effects and uh, other disease phenotypes like you know, glucose tolerance, like complication, like different com complications like fatty liver, early diabetes, necrocephalus, et cetera. So other than metabolic disease models, I want to introduce you about some rare disease models or genetic disease models. The first is about the DMD. So DMD is one of the most popular, you know, genetic disease of the world because mutation of this gene causes truncation of the dystrophin protein in skeletal muscle cells and the cardiomyocytes, which will lead to a further atrophy of these muscles and the later development of the central nervous system and other organs defects. And also some patients, especially male patients, won't survive after their 20s. So it is a very harsh you know, genetic disease. So the mechanism is shown here that DMD is one of the genes with with the most axons in our genome. It has you know near eighty of the axons, and each of the coding axons is not that big. So it is common in the patients that deletion of some of the axons will result in a premature stop coda caused by the frame shift mutation, and then the protein product will be truncated in this case. So in normal physiological stages, the strophy mediates the conjunction with between the sacrolemma membrane complex and linking proteins with the actin fragments of the muscle. And if this protein is truncated, it will be dysfunctional and causing a, dispair, a disrupted muscle contraction capacity and a, a complementary atrophy of the muscles, including the skeletal muscles and the cardiomyocytes. So Jim Fartek generated the DMD models based on the lactin background by deleting several bases, lactin bases in the axon four of this gene. And from the homozygous models we applied of this mutation, we can see decreased grip strains as well as de decreased the you know, performance in the rotor test as shown here in er earlier or later stages in this model compared with well-type control. And also, Pathologically study revealed the atrophy must skeletal muscle cells in soleus and gastrocinemas in the mutants in early or late stages. And also in stages, especially in late stages, we can see that inflammatory inflammatory cells they engraft into the skeletal muscle and also fibrosis of the cells. Fibrosis can be observed, which means that the structure and function of the skeletal muscle is you know, severely impaired. And also the detection of the heart function by creating kinase analysis revealed also a similar phenotype compared with the DMD patients. So another rare disease I want to the model I want to share is about hemophilia. Because hemophilia, I think most of you is familiar with it because it's Phenotype is simple, but also causing problems like it will flu if they affect the blood coagulation process when we were injured. So among all the hemophilia patients, hemophilia A, which means disruption of the of the FH gene in human, accounts for about eighty to eighty five percent of the patients. So, a common treatment to, for the syndrome is the. the the sesamopressin acetate to regulate the renal system and uh, you know the excretion of urinate. However, we have advanced gene therapies which complement the F8 mutation in patients by redelivering a reconstitu uh, reconstitutive shortened core F8 protein by adeno associated virus into the patients. And also, we know that recently we have a great news for these patients that the AV based therapy from Biomarine is approved.
so the patients have another, you know, uh, to the call, uh, targeting the cause therapy to treat their disease. So for evaluation of these drugs and also the re recapture of the phenotype of hemophilia A, uh, we generated the mutation in the F8 locus in mice by generating a deletion between the 16th and the 17th axon of the gene. And then after we get the homozygous, we can see different phenotypes like the expression of F8 level is significantly decreased and also the bleeding weight, bleeding time, and the time we need to, and the, the activated partial thermotesting time is wildly increased in the mutants compared with wild controls, which means that it is an appropriate and ideal model for analysis of hemophilia A in mice. So in the next part, other than the knockout-based models, we can apply for genetic disease and also for metabolic disease. I want to introduce a, about some gene humanized models using gene replacement or gene knocking in mice. So humanization, like actually every application of live animals is for a humanization application means the animal itself is a standing for human research, no matter which animal it is, but for mice, the humanization can be applied in different scales, like in genes or in immune system, in tumors or in microbiome. Since my today's topic is focused in the genome engineered mice, so I'll briefly introduce you about the gene humanization part. And if you are interested in other parts of this humanization, we can have a you know, conversation in the Q&A session, or you're welcome to contact us or Atlantis after this presentation. So gene humanization strategy in gene pharmatech can be roughly divided into these two types. The first type is the one I introduced before by, by you know, knocking a gene fragment in the five prime, between the five prime UTR and the, code, the start codon in the endogenous mice gene by but in this time, the coding sequence will be a, the human homologous gene to the endogenous gene. And with a transcription termination signal, which will stop the endogenous mice gene from expression. And then in this case, the endogenous regulation sequence with the promoter can drive the human protein expression. But in this case, it is usually a whole gene humanization, which means that this protein is fully human. And also in this case, we can introduce some you know, variations or point mutations we want in this operating frame. So, in some other cases, especially for some membrane proteins like immunocheckpoints like PD-1, CTLA-4, et cetera, et cetera, we can do partial genome humanization by replacing the extracellular domain coding sequence in the wild-type mice genome and the introduction of the human extracellular domain coding sequence to replace the mice extracellular domain coding sequence using two crispr cas sites to generate the deletion and then using homologous arms to generate this homologous direct knocking of these exons. And then it will result in expression of a partial humanized, like a chimeric human mass protein in this case, which is particularly important in some of the immuno checkpoints because some of the drugs like the monoclonal antibodies, anti-PD-1, anti-CTR4, other targets, they target for the human extracellular domain, but not, but with a very low affinity with the mice extracellular domain. So the humanization of the extracellular part will help to evaluate the affinity and the real behavior of the drugs, but also the transmembrane and the, in, and the intercellular domain is remain mice. So the downstream signal transduction of these checkpoints will be remained still functional. So, from here, I display we have we are developing uh, over seven hundred strains for humanized mice, and we can see almost all of the common Im immune checkpoints and membrane proteins here, like PD one on T cells, PD L one on the, some of tumors, CRP alpha on the macrophages and uh, macrophage on uh, macrophage targeting cells, and so on. And also, we have combined them together to get double target or even triple target humanized models for evaluation of bispecific antibodies or even or, or ADCs. And also we generate these models in different genetic backgrounds like black cis or BLBC. 
We do this because we identified in some of the cases, the different background may interrupt with the tumor growth inhibition capacity of the same drug as the anti-TGIT antibody shown here of both, you know, mammogram tumor cells efficacy test here. So a detailed analysis of the two different strains reveal that the tumor infiltrated leukocytes in BBC the, in this cell population, the NK cell level is relatively higher compared with vehicle treatment, but this in fact is not significant in the B6 background tumor generation and the drug delivery. And also in the B6 background, the Treg cell level, which may generally modulate and inhibit the cytotoxic function of the CD8 positive T cells and NK cells, is increased after drug treatment in this B6 background humanization mass, but it decreased in a Bobby C background mice in the results. So from this result and other like cytotoxic and uh, side effect toxicity, drug toxicity evaluation effects, we combine that we need both backgrounds, especially the Bobby C background, for a better and suitable evaluation of drug efficacy as well as side effect or toxicity. It is, is it necessary to, I'm sorry, I received this question here and I want to give it an answer. This our audience asked if, if, is it necessary to generate humanized models about targeted knocking at the homologous gene? Mm, it is not required, but it is, you know, Oh, I'm, I'm trying to answer it right. It is not required, but it is recommend, recommended because if I want to replace this protein itself, but not with any overexpression, doing this will simultaneously interrupt the endogenous mice gene as well as introducing the human gene. But in, but in other cases, if the regular sequence is endogenous gene is not satisfied, it's not satisfactory enough, or we need other conditions, we can generate these humanized models by a safe harbor knocking or by transgenes, even back, back transgenes. And then we can further knock out the endogenous mass gene to get a similar or even better consequence. But this strategy will be you know, time and uh, money consuming compared with the common strategies to apply. I don't know if the answer your question is good. So I'll continue to this present to stick to the presentations. And thank you for your question. And then we also have the humanized models related to metabolism target sites, like in the pot, the popular target site PCSK9, which is a, an important uh, modulator of the blood cholesterol level by inhibits LDL receptor recycling and promotes its degradation in the lysosome. So it which means that inhibition of PCSK9 will promote LDLR recycling and the cell intake of the LDL particles and then you know, lowering the blood cholesterol levels in patients. I'm sorry. Okay. So we've generated two different humanized PCSK9 mice, one with a human gene three prime UTR insertion, the other with with without this three prime UTR, but only this polydetonation signals for different purposes. So I will introduce about this three prime UTR positive model here. We can see that after we get this humanized model and we made them into homozygous, we can only detect a similar level of human PCSK9 in these homozygous models compared with well type models, the mouse PCSK9 protein level in them or memory and protein level in the well-typed mass control. And also plasma protein level analysis by ELISA reveal the expression of the humanized PCSK9. And then based on this, we apply the different kinds of drugs to test their efficacy using our humanized mice. So here's the reason why we need to do a three prime UTR humanization because we can also use it to test some RNA interference based therapies or drugs like this in case serine. So after the application of this plasma, we can application of this RAI therapy, we can see a down regulation of the LDL level in the plasma uh, with the after the dosing of the drugs and also the protein level of PCSK9 is 
significantly downregulated. And also, anti-PCSK9 antibodies drug efficacy is also tested, and we get the result of an increased LDR level in the cells. So for the last part of the humanized mouse model introduction, I want to combine it with the all, also emerging and the severe COVID-19 pandemic all over the world. So to support the preclinical evaluation and development of anti-COVID-19 drugs, we developed multiple ACE2 receptor humanized mice in different genetic backgrounds with different strategies for different purposes, like listed here. So we characterize them in different skills like the MRI expression, like this infection of these mice because well-type mice won't be infected by COVID-19 since its ACE2 is not recognized by COVID-19. And also the virus load in different organs, like mainly we focus on the lung because it is very effect it affects in human disease, in human patients, and we can see an increased viral loading in one and three days post infection, and also an increase of the level of the of the COVID nineteen neutralizing antibody in the mice. So, which pro prove that this mice model is you know, useful for the infection analysis and the drug evaluation of the COVID nineteen, and also our mice has supported this pre drug identification and the evaluation developed by the CAS Kunming and the Huaxi Hospital in China, in Sichuan, China, and as for their drugs MI9 and MI30. And uh, we really want that our models will support to, you know, treat about the COVID-19 and uh, somewhat accelerate the ending of this pandemic. Last, the genetic engineered mouse models and the techniques can also help us to generate immunodeficient related models. So the traditional immunodeficiency model most applied is the new mice based on Bobby C background with the mutation on Fox on Fox V1. This the on Fox D. I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry. This mice is impa has impaired T cell function. And also then years later, scientists from Japan developed this discovered and developed this LD skid strain based on LD background with an impaired innate, innate immunity of macrophage and dendritic cells. And also the skid mutation, which means a, a spontaneous mutation on the PRKDC locus resulting in impairment of the VDG recombination in B cells and T cells and leading to their absence in these mice. And now for the next generation or the newest generation of the most severe immunodeficient mice is the NOG or NCG or NSG strains, which use similar strategies and designs, but in but generation in different ways is an ideal model for engraftment of different kinds of human cells, even those well, which is hard to grow tumors like the cells from prostate cancer. So the NCG mice is independently developed in germ pharmatech with um, independent prop property based on the LD background and sorry based on the LD background and with we target now called the PRKDC gene and the L2 receptor gamma gene. So the LD background I mentioned before it will lead to it, it will lead to a macrophage and the dendritic cell deficiency causing by the syrup alpha mutation, and then PRKC knockout will lead to impaired BDG recombination, and thus absence of T cells and B cells. Last but not least, L2 receptor gamma knockout will lead to impairment of L2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21 pathway deficient because deficiency because L2 receptor gamma is one of the important subunits in all of these pathways receptors. And among them, the ones most important is the L2 and L15 pathway because they are important for the differentiation and the maintenance of the NK cells. Thus, this knockout leads to an absence of NK cells. So it combine them together, we get a, a severe combined immunodeficiency mass model, NCG. And it is no doubt that NCG is suitable for you know xenograph experiments and the tumor cell transplantation because of its severe immunodeficiency, and also it can help us to reconstitute the human immune system in these mice 
by applying the PBMCs and or the hematopic stem cells into the mice and generate a partial or full humanized immune system with different immune cells. And based on the NCG strains, we have knocked out some of the genes or humanized some of the genes like we show here. The knock of the B2M will, you know, lower the GVHD effects of human immune cells to the mouse body to you know, enlarge its survival. And also L2 will help the development and maintenance of the T cells. And also in other cases, like in this, we, L15 will help the maintenance of the reconstitution, the NK cell reconstitution. And the other humanizations like BAF, SexL13, they have our different functions. So these models, Together, we call them the next generation CGs, will help especially in the immune cell or immune system reconstitution in immunodeficient mice for the evaluation, which is suitable for application of these models, especially rec reconstitution of some cells with lower population in the whole blood cells, like for NK cells and then macrophages is particularly appropriate for evaluation of cell therapies like CAR-NK or CAR-M5. So as a summary, we provide one-stop solutions for medical research, starting from the mouse model results we have, like CKO, humanized and immunodeficient mouse models, or the customized models based on your innovation and ideas. And then we, after this, we provide mouse breeding and preservations, and also develop this to a ideal cohort for your experiment. And also we can help you to do preclinical drug efficacy test and the phenotyping of this models. And then last, we serve as an agency of import and export of an mouse animals in China with experience and full service. Okay. And last, thank you for your attention. And uh, please feel free to contact us and also Atlantis for our models and services. Your questions certainly well welcomed. Uh, I think Dr. Han has um, answered two of the questions in the chat box, uh, in the Q&A chat box. So um, just to see if there's any further questions. Okay. Oh, I do see one more. Uh, okay. How to choose appropriate uh, genome, genomic engineer mice model, disease model for drug efficacy tests? Yes. So some, okay. This thing is, you know, a little tricky question because the case difference is too much here. It depends on many of the, you know, issues like first, what the drug, what's the drug's type? Like if it is a biological drug, like an antibody or it, or chemical drug, like a small molecule or just combination like in ADCs. So if we, it is, it is a small molecule which is targeting a specific point mutation in the pocket. I think a point mutation model is appropriate for this evaluation. And if it is a gene therapy using, I don't know, associated virus or lentivirus to, you know, supply the genes, which is loss of function in the patients, I suggest that you use a corresponding knockout models with phenotype to test the efficiency and the, to test the efficacy, whether it can recover the phenotype of this model. And uh, I already mentioned before, for the antibody drug analysis, we recommend a partially humanized membrane protein model for your evaluation of the drug affinity and efficacy in these models. So it differs from different cases. And also in sometimes for in actual application, we are also considering the, you know, the availability of this model and also the generation timeline and how we can make it better. And in some of the cases, there are certain cases that gen genome engineering models is not suitable. In this case, we may seek for some help or the application of the, you know, surgery models or drug induced models in combination or instead. I don't know if it answers your question, but this is, you know, I think it is not the best information I can give you now. So let me read, can I just read out the next question here? Sure, no problem. Okay, uh, so another of uh, one of our audience asked, uh, what's the timeline of getting an available knockout CKO mouse from the KOAP? So the only thing we I know from information here, because I'm not familiar with the import export policy, I may want this question to be answered together with 
our agency in Atlantis. But the timeline here for generation of the mice, I can see that because if this mice is already on our you know website registered, most of the strings are kept in a frozen sperm state. So our the commonly de delivered endpoint of our product is three to five F1 mice with heterozygous of the genotype knockout or flux. So we need to do an in vitro fertilization of the sperm and then get them, raise the mice into a, a age appropriate for shipping to your facility. So in this commonly takes two to three months in our facility to prepare for the shipment. And then the timeline will be, you know, considering about the, you know, oversee export import policies and the requirement of the cut of the custom if you are in Singapore. So maybe I Yvonne, I'm sorry if you're yeah. if yeah, still yeah. here. I think, I think you're right, Dr. Khan. Basically, it all depends on, I mean, the import and export. Okay, you are not on the video. Oh, okay. hi. Yeah. So I think Dr. Khan was right about that. So it's not really depends on whether if they are down live cells, I mean, not live cells, live mouse, or they are in prior preserved state. So it really see between two to five months for them to generate enough mice before we can actually deliver over to Singapore. So the delivery, I don't think will be a big issue. It will be within one to two months. Yeah, depending whether if it is available. So the production will take a while. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And particularly for some of the popular products like popular knockouts of flux mice, we have kept some of the you know live mice in our facility. In this case, we will you know skip through the in vitro fertilization and the raising part of this mice, and we can give you um you know faster delivery. And also, there's because we have even we have already completed half more than half of the mice. KOAP project, which means that we have more than half of the genes knockout and flux alleles. There's still some ones in progress or we are not successful for this. In this case, we may negotiate first for generation of these strains for you to, of your needs. 